We're in the book of Judges. We've been cruising through the book of Judges, looking at these uh, superheroes, if you will, as they're anointed by the Spirit of God to bring about salvation to God's people. God's people continue to go through the cycle of sin. They, uh, a judge comes and delivers them, and there's usually peace in the land for that eight years or 40 years, depending on how long the judge lived. And then as soon as the leader was gone, then they would drift back to idolatry and their life of sin. And as they turned their back on God and they begin to live a life of sin, then bondage and oppression took place. And then they remembered who would rescue them and they cried out to the Lord and then the Lord would send that deliver and it would happen all over again. But as we look now, as we pick up in chapter 17 and 18 tonight, and we look at our message, confusion in the land, we realize that uh, from here on out, from chapter 17 through 21, there's no longer any judges coming to rescue. It's actually, uh, if you will, the writer of Judges takes these last chapters and says, let me tell you really what it was like in the hearts and the people of the land. Not in a way to deliver them, but to really show how far the people's hearts had gotten from God. And we'll look uh, even at you know, a really startling story next week as we get into uh, chapter 19 and 20. But when we look here tonight that there's, there's confusion in the land. We see, first of all, there's a confusion in a family because that's what happens when God is not the center of your family. There's confusion in the ministry because there's a man that we're going to see that is called and by birthright has opportunity at ministry at the house of the Lord, but he gets confused and wanders away from the house of the Lord and goes to do his own thing. Then there's confusion in a tribe, one of the tribes that had not been able to get their inheritance, and they go outside of the boundaries, if you will, of what God had given to them because they, ah, oh, that's too tough there. We can't do it there. So let's go find some easy mark outside of the will of God to do this thing. You see, God is not the author of confusion, and when there's confusion in our life, it's what we really need to do is seek the Lord in prayer and the word until clarity comes. It's like this, you know, if you're looking through a lens, sometimes I'm looking through binoculars and, and you're trying to focus it and it's all fuzzy, but then when you hit the right momentum, there's clarity and there's a clear vision. And, and this is what the people need here. And, and sad to say, they, they don't get it. Really, the heart and soul of this portion of Scripture from chapter 17 through 21 is best uh, epitomized in verse 8 of chapter 7, excuse me, verse 6 of chapter 17. It says, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. You look around and you see families that are just doing what's right in their own eyes. They don't know the Lord. They don't know his word. They don't know how to make things work. So there's confusion. We see it in our nation, don't we? There's confusion in the land. We've lost a sense of clarity about the Lord and absolute right and wrong and the truth of morality that is given to us from a God in heaven. And there's confusion. There's moral confusion. There's political confusion. There's relational confusion. But I pray that you're not confused. I pray that you know the Lord and you've fallen in love with his word and prayer and the guiding and leading and illumination of the Holy Spirit to lead you through life. And there, it doesn't mean we won't have foggy times or times where things are a little fuzzy and we're trying to focus the lens through prayer and the word to know what God wants. So let's look at this, these three stories, basically. They're all interwoven together. But first, um, real confusion in a family. It tells us in verse 1 of chapter 17, Now there was a man from the mountains of Ephraim whose name was Micah. And he said to his mother, The 1,100 shekels of silver that were taken from you and on which you put a curse, even saying it in my ears, Here is the silver with me, I took it. And his mother said, May you be blessed by the Lord my son. So when he had returned the 1,100 shekels of silver to his mother, his mother said, I had wholly dedicated the silver from my hand to the Lord for my son to make a carved image and a molded image. Now, therefore, I will return it to you. Thus, he returned the silver to his mother. Then his mother took 200 shekels of silver and gave them to the silversmith, and he made it into a carved image and a molded image. And they were in the house of Micah. The man Micah had a shrine and made an ephod and household idols, and he consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. 
we see confusion in a home. First off, we see a guy by the name of Micah, who, whose name means who is like Yahweh, but he, he's really not following in the footsteps of a glorious name like that. That's a pretty cool name. Who is like Yahweh? Who is like the Lord? And yet Micah has a confession. Chapter 17, the writer of Judges just drops us right into their living room, if you will. Can you imagine this? You've got a grown man because he has grown sons. And so you've got a grown man. Maybe he's my age. He's right at the 50-ish mark. And he's got his mother. Extended families live together. And his mother's living in the house as well. And so maybe she's 70-ish, 75. And we get dropped right into their living room. There's mother, grandma, in her robe and slippers, fluffy slippers. And he says, Mom, I have a confession to make. Yes, honey, what is it? You know, uh, that 1,100 pieces of silver, you see, Grandma's loaded. Because 1,100 pieces of silver, we'll see here in a few moments, like 10 shekels is a year's worth of wages for this uh, Levite that we're going to talk about. And yet, she has 1,100 pieces of silver that are stolen now think about it. You're living in the mountains of Ephraim. You're maybe in a kind of a rural setting. And it's not like you're in the hubbub of a city. And you're in this, and all of a sudden, it, maybe it's under the mattress, it's under the bed, it's in a shoebox. Where is it? I don't know. 1,100 pieces of silver. No doubt she did not have a safe. And the 1,100 pieces of silver, bam, they're just gone. She finds the empty box or looks under the mattress. Maybe she just pulls it out every other week to tap and just make sure it's there. And it's gone. And so she goes, comes out, and she's so upset. She's like, oh, now only the people in the household really have access, right? Think about it. Only the people in the family know where grandma's stash is. And she's got 1,100 pieces of silver. And so she announces a curse. Whoever stole, maybe this is at breakfast time, the whole family's there, everybody's there. Whoever stole this 1,100 pieces of silver, may the God of Israel curse their life. Now, the person that thinks about <laughs> that he's stolen the silver, it's her son, Micah, <laughs> who obviously is not a very godly son, <laughs> and he starts thinking about it. Does it take him a day? Does it take him, was that in the morning she, you know, uttered the curse? And you have to understand, all the way through this story, you really get a sense of strong superstition rather than godliness in the family. And so he's probably thinking, oh, no, i got the 1,100 pieces of silver, but now I'm going to be cursed. What's that curse going to look like? Is that leprosy? Is, is that, you know, a sudden heart attack? Is that you know, this happened and this, this disease? What kind of curse is going to come up on me that my mom has put on me? And we don't know if it's a day. We don't know if it's a week or a month. But finally he comes clean. He says, hey, Mom, you know that 1,100 pieces of silver? Yes, honey. I took it. I stole it. Oh, God bless you, son. She doesn't say it, but... I knew it was you. <laughs> he he, he might have had that uh, tendency from the time he was a little guy, whatever. But it's interesting, isn't it, the way that she responds to that when he says, I took it, she says. And his mother said, may you be blessed by the Lord, my son. And so he returned the 1,100 pieces of silver to her. But she said, you know, this, this 1,100 pieces of silver, son, it was, I've dedicated to God, the God of Israel, and I'm going to make a molded image. I'm going to make a carved image and a molded image. She's going to make two things, a carved image. You know, you could carve it out of soft stone or wood and then cover it with silver. Or a molded image is just a mold you would pour hot molten silver in. She's going to make each. But she's going to dedicate that to God. You see a, a, an immediate confusion in the morality of their family that a, a grown son would be robbing and stealing from his mother, a woman that's old enough to be grandma. Now, I, I'm sure, I, I don't know if uh, you lived a life like me, but I had friends that stole from their parents and, and their grandparents and, and, and everybody in, in, in a radical way, a frightening way, and at times even being in the home with them and asking, what are you doing? What are you doing to taking that from your parents? And only to find out afterwards, though, that this one friend that was always stealing from his parents, every time he got busted, he was telling them it was me. And his parents just absolutely hated my guts. And I was like, why are your parents so hateful towards me? I don't know. I don't know. He'd just act like he didn't know. And he, he would just rob from them and rob from them and rob from them. And then he robbed from his grandparents. 
He got strung out on meth, and he started robbing from his grandparents, and he called them, and he told them, and he wiped out basically all their savings because he said, if you don't give me this money, and you should have saw his grandparents, they were the sweetest little couple you ever met, just a, a farmer and his wife, you know, almost 80 years old, and he said, if you don't give me this money, I'm going to burn your house down on your ears when you're asleep. Terrified his grandparents. And there's something wrong in a family where within the family context, robbery is a normal thing. Whether it's stealing quarters out of mama's purse, stealing dollar bills, stealing things and hawking them. I had a friend that we would go to his grandmother's house and I would sit in the living room and he would distract his grandmother to ask her to go get something else and he would run into her bedroom where he knew she had a drawer full of cash and he would take a handful of cash from his grandmother. See, we, we, live, we grew up without God. We grew up in a life of sin and darkness and drugs and all kinds of perversity. And everything we, every, everywhere we moved and touched, we, we defiled everything and everybody. I, I wouldn't be so shocked by this passage of Scripture, except these are the people of the Lord. This is Israel. These are the people that knew the God of Israel, supposedly, but they had drifted so far from God, their morality is now confused. Micah's stealing from his mom, and his, his mom is, quote, dedicating money to God to offer or have made idols. The first two commandments are you to have no other gods before me and to make no molden image or carved image. So right off the bat, we see that the broken down morality within this home, within the fabric of the family. God has three institutions, if you will. There's the family, the building block of all society. There is the church or the house of the Lord. In the Old Testament, we have the tabernacle and uh, Judaism. In the New Testament, we have the church uh, of God. And then we have government. These three organizations or entities God has created. But when the fabric of the family breaks down, everything else goes to pot. And some of you are here, sitting here as brokenhearted parents or grandparents because these stories resonate with things in your past. Right now you've got a grandchild out of control. You've got a son out of control. And the breakdown, though, you might be walking with God, they're not. And as we see this story unfold, there's a confusion. They're breaking the first commandment, having no other gods before the Lord, making molden images, not honoring your father and mother, stealing, bearing false witness. No doubt the first time he was challenged by his mom, hey, do you know where that went? He probably lied. Coveting, he coveted that silver that his mom had. We, we, we definitely have blown up the Ten Commandments just in the family dynamic, barely getting into the story. Now, with that said... It tells us not only is his mom giving money to have these idols made, but it tells us in verse 5, the man Micah had a shrine, a spiritual place loaded with idols. Not one idol, but many idols, if you will. It said, and made an ephod, which was a uh, vest-like um, garment that the priests would wear, the high priest and his ephod and his, his special garment. And it says, and he had household idols, plural, and he consecrated one of his sons who became his priest. So he takes one of his boys and he says, yeah, you'll do. You're going to be my priest. This shrine is going to be our sanctuary, and these little gods are our gods. Now, the mind-blowing thing about this is at the end of chapter 18, when we get to the end of this message that the writer of Judges is giving to us, it says, but the tabernacle was at Shiloh. The house of the Lord was put in a specific place, and the people could only worship and sacrifice to the Lord there. They had to come from all over Israel three times a year to the feasts and these uh, wonderful feasts, the Feast of Passover, Unleavened Bread, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. And, and with these feasts, they would come, all the men of Israel. And if it was a long ways to take a sacrifice, then they would sell a lamb here at home, if you will, take the money and go there, and then they would have opportunity to buy doves or pigeons or lambs, depending on the wealth that they had, that they could offer sacrifices there. But here's a family that is not only worshiping idols, rejecting the true and living God, stealing from one another, and now he's setting up his own religious system. He's got his shrine, his tabernacle. He's got his priest, 
his son. He's got his own priestly garments, an ephod. And they've got these idols. Because you see, as I began, verse 6, in those days there was no king in Israel. Every did, everyone did what was right in his own eyes. There are those who reject, like in this old time, Mike and his household, rather than making their pilgrimage to, or they might have done this stuff in addition to. They might have went on the pilgrimage to Shiloh. But then they had this mixed up idol worshiping going on at home. And in this, there are those who will reject the house of the Lord. The writer of Hebrews tells us that in chapter 10. Don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the custom of some is. But as we see this day approaching, we, we should get together to stir up love and good works. You know, some people just bail on the house of the Lord and they go, you know, I don't need you guys down there at church. I go up in the mountains and I worship God out there in nature. Or it's just my family and I, we have church at home. And not that you can't have Bible study and prayer and worship at home. Most early churches were home fellowships. There's nothing wrong with that. But even the home fellowships were other people gathering together at home to worship the Lord. And there's always these, the, you know, a certain group of people that's kind of like, we four and no more, and we're not going to join with the rest of the church, and we don't need church to be this or that. And yet, when you watch them and you hear their ideology, you hear the, their theology, oftentimes there are people that just begin to depart and go, Wah! they get weird. Because they're not in a place where they're healing, hearing wholesome Bible teaching on a consistent basis. And so there's a a real confusion in this family of Micahs. And yet they have a lot of God talk going on. He has a great name, who is like Yahweh. His mom is saying, oh, blessed are you of the Lord. I'm making this dedication to God. Just because people have a lot of God talk does not mean they're straight in their walk with the Lord. I have people come in church over these 20 years and have told me some of the weirdest things. They'll come up to me and say, Pastor, you know, I've always been spiritual. Okay, okay. And, you know, I know the Lord. I'm like, great, I'm glad you know the Lord. And I just want you to know there is, a, there is an energy about you that is so positive in your energy. I'm like, we like to call that the Holy Spirit. <laughs> but you can tell as you're talking to him, and I'm just really into these crystals right now. This is what God's showing me. <laughs> and they're going into this new age thing. And I'm like, hey, man, all, all that stuff is taking you off course from Jesus. It, it, you're, you're mingling together. Yeah, you have Jesus, and you have all this other stuff thrown in, too. We had a guy come into our church for some time, and he was from Sri Lanka, and he was, he was Hindu. And he told me, he came up to me very, you know, passionately, Pastor Rick, I, I'm, going, I'm going to believe in your Jesus. I said, that's great. I said, the problem is not you believing in the Jesus that we believe in. It's you forsaking the other 10,000 gods you believe in. And his face and his countenance dropped, and he said, why, can I add Jesus to the other 10,000? <laughs> no, he, he, there's a throne room for one in your heart, and Jesus wants it, and he's a jealous God, and he can't share it with anybody. But there's a lot of confusion. There's a, a smorgasbord of religion in our country that the, the watchword of today is tolerance. And you just got to, you know, mix it all together. And it's like you, you throw in some Mormonism, you throw in the Jehovah Witness thing, you throw in some uh, New Age stuff, you throw in some humanism and some evolution, and you throw in some Jesus and Bible stuff, and you put it all in a bag and shake it all up, and then you go, this is what I believe. And that's what you call garbage there. You take that out with the trash. And tr the Lord wants to be the Lord of our life. So there's confusion in the home, and we shouldn't be surprised if there's confusion in the home. Ultimately, we're also going to see confusion in ministry. And I think that people are a little more shocked by this. Everybody knows dysfunctional families, but what about people that are dysfunctional in ministry and ministers? Notice what it says in verse 7. Now, there was a young man from Bethlehem and Judah of the family of Judah. He was a Levite and was staying there. The man departed from the city of Bethlehem and Judah to stay wherever he could find a place. Then he came to the mountains of Ephraim, to the house of Micah, as he journeyed. And Micah said to him, where do you come from? So he said to him, I am a Levite from Bethlehem and Judah, and I am on my way to find a place to stay. Micah said to him, dwell with me and be a father and a priest to me, and I will give you 10 shekels of silver per year, a suit of clothes, and your sustenance. 
So the Levite went in. Then the Levite was content to dwell with the man, and the young man became like one of his sons to him. So Micah consecrated the Levite, and the young man became his priest. He must have fired his son from being priest. Now Micah's going to be, or excuse me, uh, now this young man's going to be his priest. And lived in the house of Micah. Then Micah said, now I know that the Lord, notice the God talk. Now I know that the Lord will be good to me since I have a Levite as a priest. That's what Micah says. You see, he couldn't be any more dead wrong. People comfort themselves through superstition and certain relationships and, oh, God must be blessing me. And if you look at it, you say, what you're saying is a blessing from God is actually a horrendous moral tragedy of what you're doing. Here is, and we find out his name later at the end of uh, chapter 18. His name's Jonathan. Jonathan's a Levite. Jonathan's been hanging out in Bethlehem. Bethlehem's uh, a little closer, if you will, to uh, Shiloh. And, and here is a Levite. There's 48 cities that the Levites could live in. Okay? But Jonathan the Levite is, is kind of a restless soul. He, he seems to be wandering around just to find some gig wherever he can. And he's lost his bearings because, you see, as a Levite, he was there to help the priests in their services, sacrifices and various things. They assisted the priests. They could be involved in worship. They also could be involved, as we see in the book of Nehemiah chapter 8, in teaching the Word of God. And so he had this high and incredible privilege just by birth, just because he was a Levite, that he could hang out with the house of the Lord and, and, and be a servant there with his family. He could hang out at God's house. He could help share God's word. He could be involved with worshiping the true and living God. He could even help out with the priests with certain duties when it came to sacrifices. But here's a guy that, just like Micah, birds of a feather flock together. Have you ever noticed that? People that are kind of weird just get weird together. They just, they're already weird and they just hook up wherever it is. And if your kid's in trouble at this school and you go, you know what the problem with this school is, is I got to get my boy out of this school. You take him from that school to another school, he'll make friends just like the friends he had there because birds of a feather flock together. That's who he's looking for. It's not that the kids at this school are any worse. They're, they're sinners and they're sinners over here, but they'll flock together. So here you have a wandering soul, Micah and his mother and their idolatry. They've wandered from the house of God and they've set up their own religious system. They've set up their own religious system. They've kicked God out. They've moved themselves in. And now here's another wandering soul. He's a minister, if you will. He's a servant of the Lord to serve around the house of the Lord. He was to eat his food from the house of the Lord. And yet he wanders off. Ah, oh, you know, who needs that tabernacle stuff? Who needs the word of God? Who needs Yahweh? You know, those people down there, they're so uptight. Just believe your sacrifices, I mean, your sins have to be covered with blood and all that. You know what? We, I, I need to find some people that are more on my, my wavelength. And so he wanders up to the mountains of Ephraim and Pray tell, who does he meet? A guy that is a kindred spirit that is just as confused as he is. And now they get to live out their days in confusion together. Isn't that great? Find other people that are just as confused about their relationship with God, clear direction, the word of God. And as I talked about beliefs being put in a bag and shaken together, and this is what comes out. Put people in a bag, shake them together, and this is what comes out. Now, Mike is pretty excited that he has Jonathan a Levite because now he is actually of the family of Levi. Though he's not of the son of Aaron, only a son of Aaron could be a priest. But it's the next best thing. It's better than his son. They're not of the tribe of Levi. At least he's got the next best thing. And so in all of that, if you really know God, if Micah really knows God, he would not say what he says at the end of chapter 17, now I know that the Lord will be good to me since I have a Levite as my priest. He'd fall on his face and repent and say, God, I'm so sorry. I just turned away from you. I've lost my bearings. I, I've, I've been involved in idolatry. I want to tear all this down. I, wanna, I, wanna, I, I don't want to have anything to do with this religious idolatry. I want to go to Shiloh. I want to go to the house of the Lord where the Ark of the Covenant is and where your true priesthood is set up with the sons of Aaron as high priest. 
and the Levites to help and where true worship happens. The devil is constantly trying to spin humans out and whisper in their ear to get them off on their own adventure in confusion. That's what the devil's all about. We live in a real spiritual warfare that we have. And here Micah gives him. He says, you know what? I'm going to give you 10 shekels a year. I'm going to give you a new set of clothes every year, and I'll take care of your sustenance, basically room and board. Man, you got it made. And Jonathan, who is just looking for a place to kick up or start up his own little religious system, he found a guy that would actually sponsor it. And here's an older guy saying, hey, would you be a priest and father to me? Would you be a priest? Would you be a spiritual leader in my life? And here's a young guy. And here's an old guy. It couldn't be more confusing. It couldn't be more backwards. It couldn't be more upside down. But you see, in a season where everybody does what seems right in their own eyes, I guess it's right on course for the times, isn't it? You know, I talk to people week in and week out at our fellowship, before service, after service, Wednesday night, Saturday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night. And there are so many people that are so seriously confused on what clear teaching of God's word is and what God desires of us and how we can live that out. And it really is a challenge in our day and age to stand for what the truth of, that God gives to us to teach. So we have confusion in the family, we have confusion in the ministry. Now we have a tribe that's really confused. It's the tribe of Dan. In verse 1 of chapter 18, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel, and in those days the tribe of the Danites was seeking an inheritance for itself to dwell in. For until that day, their inheritance among the tribes of Israel had not fallen to them. So the children of Dan sent five men of their family from their territory, men of valor from Zorah to Eshtaol, to spy out the land and search it. They said to them, Go search the land. So they went to the mountains of Ephraim, to the house of Micah. Everybody, what is this place, like a major pit stop? Everybody traveling through show, shows up at Micah's house and lodged there. Verse 3, while they were at the house of Micah, they recognized the voice of the young Levite. They turned aside and said to him, who brought you here? What are you doing in this place? What do you have here? And he said to them, thus and so Micah did for me, and he has hired me, and I have become his priest." He's hired me. I'm a hireling. They recognized his voice. I think this is fascinating. You know, the different tribes had different accents, no doubt. And they, they hear him, and uh, he just has this, uh, I don't know what his tribe, you know, God bless y'all, whatever his uh, accent is. And they're like, hey, you, you sound like a Levi. What, you know, tell us how you ended up here, way up here, and away from Shiloh, and away from the house of the Lord. And here, here you are, and, and now you're just a, you're a hired gun? You're a hired guy brought on by Micah. And now, the Danites had a possession, or it was mapped out for them, for, in Joshua, what they were to get. Uh, chapter 19 of Joshua. And it was tough. There were Amorites in the mountains. There were Philistines on the, on the, on the shoreline, Gaza, and that area. And they were kind of squeezed between those two. And the Danites could not get their inheritance. Now, I say could not. I should say would not. Because all of the tribes, when they came with faith and obedience, everywhere they put their foot, God gave them. But they had to come with faith and obedience, and they also had to fight tenaciously. They had to bring it all to the table. They had to bring, we would say, they had to bring some want to spiritually and physically and in the battle to go get it. But every single tribe, God said, he mapped out the border. This is yours, now go get it. And every single tribe that went and got it, they received it. But there were some tribes that they tried, oh, oh, that was hard. Oh, they have pointy knives. Oh, you know, these guys don't just roll over and die. You got to go get them and you got to believe that your God is bigger than them because the tribes that could not get their inheritance, specifically in this case, Dan, the, the opposition was bigger than their God. Their troubles were bigger than their God. But the people that got their inheritance, their God was bigger than their opposition. And they could take the land by faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And God wants us to bring a trusting heart that says, God, I'm weak. 
This is a huge task, but you're big, and I believe that my weakness connected to your strength is always, always, always the formula for victory. So I'm, I'm, I'm bringing my part to the table. Weakness. <laughs> Mr. Weakness showed up. But through Christ, who strengthens us, we can do all things. And so the Danites did not get their inheritance, but they should have. This would not be even happening. But there was confusion in the tribe. You know, sometimes people say, you know, my lot in life's too hard for me. They're, they're struggling in their marriage. They're struggling raising their three kids. They're struggling in their financial situation. They're struggling at work. And man, life's hard, isn't it? No, the Lord never promised you a little picnic. He said, in this world, you're going to have tribu tribulation, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. So through faith in him, since he overcame the world, I also can overcome. You can overcome. And so in this dynamic of life, there's hard things. There's hard seasons. There's hard trials. There's hard things. But by faith and obedience and giving yourself and pointing yourself towards the task that God has given you, you can trust God and you can and will have victory through faith in the Lord. That's what he's promised you. He will give it to you. Doesn't mean that it's easy. But I meet Christians and they go, oh, you know, I'm like, you know, we prayed for six months. Wow, you got that job. Praise the Lord. How's it going? You've been going what? Four weeks? Oh, I quit. I said, man, we prayed for like six months for you to get a job. You got a job. And, oh, you know, I didn't really like the manager. You got a family to feed, right? Like that's a, you get it. You get, sometimes it's so hard to be pastoral. You just want to say, suck it up, chump, and go to work. You know, trust God and go to work. <laughs> just, oh, it's hard. How you and your wife doing? I know you've been going through some struggles. I've been praying for you. Oh, I just left, man. I just bailed. So, what do you mean you just bailed? You make this incredible promise like, till death do us part or something? Isn't it like a vow, a covenant, like you're in there and, and it says things like, for better or for worse? I know it's worse. I, I promise all couples that get married, it's going to be better and it's going to be worse. You're going to be rich and you're going to be poor. And you're going to be sick and you're going to be healthy. It's all coming, man. It's all, I mean, there's a, there's a pile of garbage <laughs> coming your way with life. That's just the way it is. But if you think, you know, people, there's, oh, that was hard. So I just gave up on that one and I'm looking for the new model. Well, that one's going to be hard too, man. If you get good at quitting or you get good at making excuses, you'll never become good at anything else. Because as soon as things get tough, you exit stage left. The Danites, they're facing, God gave them this inheritance. Now go get it. Oh, it's too hard. You know, We've we got to find something easier, man. It's going to be easy. It's too hard. But what about all these other tribes? They did it. They trusted God. God was big for them. They don't have anything going on you don't have going on. I know, but they're different and they're opposition and our guys are, the people we're finding are bigger. You know, they're badder, they're whatever they are. So, they meet this Levite. He tells them, I'm a hired hand here for Micah. And verse 5 says, So they said to him, Please inquire of God that we may know whether the journey on which we will go will be prosperous. And the priest said to them, Go in peace, the presence of the Lord be with you on your way. People that are into false things and false worship at least usually want to keep their message positive. Oh, yeah, God bless you. There's no consistency. Everything they're doing is idolatrous and wrong, and he's not a priest. But the Danites, they're, they're just as spiritually confused as Micah is and as Jonathan the Levite is. They go, oh, man, you're, you're a priest here in this household? you got all these false gods? Why don't you bless us, man? Bless us. They're confused. How, how can you... I mean, honestly, do you want a blessing from people that are totally warped in their perspective? And yet, at least that person's like, oh, you always got to keep it positive. I, I think it's funny that the confusion, even in America, because we have such roots of Christianity, every, every family has some God talk, don't they? I mean, they can be a drunk one moment and the next thing, oh, the man upstairs and, you know, and, and Ethel, she's in a better place. She's with the Lord. She's, you know, there. She loves the fish by the stream of life, you know, and they get all this weird God talk. They never walk with God. They live like heathens. They use the Lord's name in vain through the week more than they ever praise his name. They're so utterly upside down and confused. You, you ever want to watch the Grammys or you want to watch the Oscars and here's people and their, their songs about as blasphemous it, as it can be or their movies about as blasphemous as it can be. Oh, God bless you. Thank you, Jesus, for doing this. <laughs> Have you heard their song? <laughs> 
It's, thank you, Jesus. It's just God talk. It's just God bless America. As long as you should say God bless at the end of anything, you're good to go. Even though your life is lived in a sewer the rest of the week. Isn't that something? It's crazy. It's really crazy. Well, the Danites, they're just confused. They want a blessing. Oh, God's going to be with you guys. God bless you. I'm a pagan priest. I lead idol worship. I'm the priesthood of this household, though I'm not supposed to be. God bless you guys. Sometimes people come up after church and they want me to bless them. I had a couple, this was a year or two ago, and they came up to me and said, Pastor, we want your blessing on us. And I said, okay, I don't, what kind of blessing you want? I'm not, you know, they were kind of visitors. And they said, well, the two of us are living together and we just want your blessing. And I said, well, how can I bless that? They said, what do you mean? We're living together. We love each other. We're, you know, fortunate. I said, well, I can, I, I can bless you by helping you either move out and repent or get married. We'll help you out either way. Both those ways are blessings. You know, if you want to move out, praise the Lord. And if you want to get married, praise the Lord. We'll help you with those. But for me to say, bless thee. <laughs> As, it, bless, you, bless your sexual immorality. It'd be like, you know, a guy with his fifth of, hey, pastor, bless you. God bless your drunkenness. You got some, co- God bless your cocaine, you know. Have a great high. Is there any, anything inconsistent about that? It seems a little strange to anybody but me. So he tells them to go their way. Verse 7 says, So the five men departed and went to Laish. They saw the people who were there, how they dwelt safely in the manner of the Sidonians, quiet and secure. There were no rulers in the land who might put them to shame for anything. They were far from the Sidonians, and they had no ties with anyone. Then the spies came back to their uh, brethren at Zorah and Eshtol, and their brethren said to them, What is your report? So they said, Arise, let us go up against them, for we have seen the land, and indeed it is very good. Would you do nothing? Do not hesitate to go and enter and possess the land. When you go, you will come to a secure people, a large land, for God has given it into your hands, a place where there is no lack of anything that is on the earth. This is in the north at a place called Tel Dan uh, today, and um, there at the kind of border of Lebanon, and once again, God's with you. Now, it appears that, a uh, little, little debate about this, but that Dan goes outside of the boundary. They, the Sidonians were not a group of people they were, they were to exterminate, like the Amorites, the Girgashites, the uh, Hivites, all the other ites. And uh, so, but he says, hey, you know, here's an open land. They're, they're kind of an isolated, it's a beautiful region up there, and um, they're just they're secure. They have no safety. They, I mean, uh, as far as like military or any kind of support. And it's just this naked open land that you can just go slaughter these people. But you see outside the boundaries of God's inheritance, that wasn't the command. But once again, let's get outside of God's boundaries. Let's be confused about what God has for us. And now let's go slaughter a people. Now, it was a biblical command within the confines of the nation of Israel or the land of Canaan. But outside the confines, there were different rules of engagement for war. But once again, hey, God's given it to us. You see, when you're confused about who God is and who you are and what the word of God says, pretty much all bets are off for really knowing what is in God's will. That's why the Bible tells us to have our mind be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might know what is the good, acceptable, perfect will of God. But they don't. Everybody does what seems right in their own eyes. Now it goes on here to tell us in verse 11, And 600 men of the families of the Danites went from there, from Zorah and Eshtaol, armed with weapons of war. Then they went up and encamped in kirjath Jerem in Judah. Therefore they call the place Mehaneh. Dan, or Camp of Dan, to this day. There it is, west of kirjath Jerem, And they passed from there to the mountains of Ephraim and came to the house of Micah. Once again, got to show up at Micah's house. Then the five men who had gone to spy out the country of Laish answered and said to their brethren, Do you know 
that there are in these houses an ephod, household idols, a carved image, a molded image. Now, therefore, consider what you should do. So they turned aside there and came to the house of the young Levite, to the house of Micah, and greeted him. The 600 men, armed with their weapons of war, who were, uh, with, were of the children of Dan, stood by the entrance of the gate. Then the five men who had gone to spy out the land went up. Entering there, they took the carved image, the ephod, the household idols, and the molded image. The priests stood at the entrance of the gate with the 600 men who were armed with weapons of war. When these men went into Micah's house and took the carved image, the ephod, the household idols, and the molded image, the priests said to them, what are you doing? These men from Dan, not only are they going to take a people that are uh, on the northern fringe, uh, a bit debatable whether it's within their territory, to do something that's kind of outside the bounds of what God had given them already. He had already allotted them an area of land. And now on the way, they break in and entering. Micah's not at the house. So these five guys, they just, I mean, you got 600 uh, armed soldiers there with you. And their wives and children are with them, so there's probably 2,000 people. And they're outside your gate, and the five men just march right into the house, take the ephod, take the the idols and the molded image and carved image and all the wealth of that as well as the idolatry of that. And and now this Jonathan, the Levite, goes, what are you doing? You're just robbing my master. You're robbing uh, Micah. And they said in verse 19, be quiet. Put your hand over your mouth and come with us. Be a father and a priest to us. Is it better for you to be a priest to the household of one man or that you be a priest to a tribe and a family in Israel? So the priest's heart was glad, and he took the ephod and the household idols and the carved image and took his place among the people. He's like, oh, as long as you're taking me along, it's all cool. I just got a promotion. I was the priest of a a man's household. Now I got a tribe. Look, my flock has just grown. I've got about 2,000 people here. And I'm going to be a father and a priest to a tribe, the tribe of Dan, in their idolatry. And uh, he's happy because he got his little job promotion because that's the way hirelings are. Just just give them a few more people and a little more money and they're good to go. That's all they need. This is so sad. (laughs) Verse 21, then they turned and departed and put the little ones, the livestock and the goods in front of them. When they were a good way away uh, from the house of Micah, the men who were in the house near Micah's house gathered together and overtook the children of Dan. And they called out to the children of Dan. So they turned around and said to Micah, What ails you that you have gathered such a company? So he said, You have taken away my gods which I made, and the priest and you have gone away. Now what more do I have? How can you say to me, What ails you? And the children of Dan said to him, Do not let your voice be heard among us, lest angry men fall upon you and you lose your life with the lives of your household. Then the children of Dan went their way, and when Micah saw that they were too strong for him, he turned and went back to his house. Micah, the idol-worshiping man that had made a shrine, had molded images that his uh, carved image and molded image that his mom had kicked in the 200 shekels of silver. They even took his priest, his new priest that he had on staff for family worship. And as they're all going down the road, this to me is the saddest part of this whole passage, that here Micah, you hear his heart. And this is the saddest, I mean, because you have to use your brain here a little bit and just think just a little bit when he says in verse 24, so he said, you have taken away my gods, which I made. Now, man, if your God can be stolen, you got the wrong God, right? I mean, if you have to keep your God under lock and key, (laughs) think about it. And not only can your God be stolen, it says the God which I made. I made it. Do you make anything good? I mean, I can draw a stick, man. I mean, he not only is it stolen, but he made it. You see, by nature of being a creator, if I make something, I'm the creator and it's the creation. By sheer logic, it's less than me. I made it. Therefore, I'm superior to it, right? And so here is, my gods, you stole my gods. You carried away my gods. And I made them. It so cracks me up because if you had a, just any, this, this is why truly spiritual blindness, you're so blind. 
You're so blind, you can't even see that. It's like Isaiah saying, oh, it's Isaiah 44, 45, when he says, you, you take a piece of wood and you chop it up, and with one piece of the wood, you carve out an idol for yourself that you bow and pray to. And the other part of the log, you throw in the fire and you cook some bread, you know? I mean, it, it's the same piece of wood. You just put some little eyes and some little hands, and, and you did all of that stuff. But just think about it. Gods that can be carried away. Don't you want God to carry you? Gods that you've made. But the Bible says God made you. Do you have to protect? You see, Micah's trying to rescue. His gods have been taken hostage. <laughs> Help for ransom. <laughs> it's like that story of the little boy who was Catholic. He was about eight. And he told his, he told his mom, <laughs> he, he told his mom, if I don't get a bike, I'm going to do something drastic. Well, they didn't have the money for the bike. And, and so finally, he said, that's it, mom. He's in the living room. He was by their little Catholic shrine. And she said, well, what are you going to do that's drastic? And he grabbed a hold of Mary. And he said, you tell God I got his mama to like get my bike. <laughs> God has created us. I need God's protection. I need God to run after me. I need God's strength. I need God. And my God is not a small God that is a statue or some, you know, a lot of different things can become, get the affection of your heart. Jesus said mammon, which is really money, can be your God. Covetousness, when we covet certain things, they become the passion of our life. And Colossians 3 tells us that covetousness, which is idolatry, we set our hearts and our minds on something, and this is what's going to make us happy. Because you see, not only does he say that you've taken away my gods that I have made, but he says, now what more do I have? I'm lost now. Is there anything in your life that if he or she or it or them or whatever was taken away from your life, that that would be it for you? Now you're lost? Now, don't get me wrong. If I was to lose my precious wife, there's a grieving process, and there's a sense of loss with death and different things like that, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about things that you so have your heart set on that if it was stripped away tonight, you would be crushed. There would be no more strength in you because you've made it a God, even though it's less than you. You've carried it, but... It can't carry you. To me, Micah's plight as a confused man among the people of God in Israel, among a tribe, the tribe of Dan, who now thinks they, uh, they've uh, really <laughs> hit the lottery, if you will, with this priest and these false gods. They go up to establish the idolatry in Dan, which becomes a hindrance to the northern kingdom until the captivity, and we read that. So he says in verse 27, So they took the things Micah had made and the priests who had belonged to him and went to Laish to a people quiet and secure, and they struck them with the edge of the sword and burned the city with fire. There was no deliverer because it was far from Sidon, and they had no ties with anyone. It was in the valley that belongs to Beth Rehob. So they... Built the, rebuilt the city and dwelt there, and they called the name of the city Dan after the name of Dan, their father, who was born to Israel. However, the name of the city formerly was Laish. Then the children of Dan set up for themselves the carved image, and Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Manasseh, and his sons were priests to the tribe of Dan until the day of the captivity of the land. So they set up for themselves Micah's uh, carved image, which he made all the time that the house of God was in Shiloh. All the time that there was this false worship in Dan, there was real worship going on at Shiloh. Wherever false worship is gathered together worshiping, know and believe that God always has a remnant of faithful people that are wanting to worship the true and living God. But sometimes we get confused when we talk to the two different groups because they, 
the people that are off in their own false worship, they have enough God talk to kind of confuse us. As a matter of fact, Jesus gave us a little hint, a, a little help, if you will. Just turn right in your Bible, go to Matthew chapter 7 for kind of a final passage of Scripture to bring this into the light, even as the Lord Jesus would teach us. It says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 29, even the previous verses are incredible, just I mean, laying into this, but... Uh, in preparation for this, but for the sake of time, let's just pick it up in verse 21. It says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Just because somebody uses the name of the Lord does not mean they're on their way to heaven. And there's a lot of people you're going to meet, and, you, and it's a little confusing. They'll use enough God talk to kind of confuse you, but they'll use the name of the Lord. They'll use God's name. They'll even use Jesus' name at times. But he says, um, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Because he says, but he who does the will of my Father. People that are genuinely born again, discover God's will from his word, empowered by the Holy Spirit, want to do what God wants them to do. That's just what happens. Genuinely saved people discover the truth of God's word, and in the power of the Holy Spirit, they want to be obedient to God. They want to turn from their life of sin. They don't want to just use empty lip service. I have a lot of family that knows enough about Jesus to be scary. By that I mean they know enough lingo that when they're around the preacher, you know what I mean? They can throw it out there. Oh yeah, and this and that, and what about a mission trip? And, and you know their life. They're living in sin. They're living in this way. And, and if you ever wonder, just look at their Facebook. You know exactly what they're doing. Right? It's all out there. People are advertising, I'm stupid and I want the whole world to know it. <laughs> so you wonder, you just, you know, you check it out. So not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Verse 22, but many say to me, will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Once again, everything we just read about in Judges 17 and 18 was lawlessness. Everything that was being practiced was against God's moral instruction. So it was lawlessness. They knew what God said, you're supposed to worship down at Shiloh, but they didn't go. They knew that only the Aaron's family could hold the priesthood, but they made their own priests. They knew they were not to make, have any gods before God or make any molded image, but they did it anyway. They knew they were not to bow down to false gods, but they did it anyway. It was a lawlessness, but they used enough of God's word to kind of cover it, if you will. Verse 24, Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house. And it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. Jesus thought, taught in such powerful authority that it just blew the people's minds. And this was his message of authority leading up to their statement about his authority. He said, you know what? People are going through life and every single one of us in this room is building. Every one of you in this room is building a house. I'm building a house. You're building a house. And we're building a house. And you know, if you know anything about construction, you, you dig down and you're going to lay the foundation. And, you know, in our uh, area, you have to go down three feet for frost line and all these different things. you got to have footings, and then you got to have a foundation stem wall that comes up out of the ground, and, 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 and it's compacted, and, it, and it's prepared. But nobody just comes and starts laying out wood on dirt or sand. Now, it might stand there for a while until a storm and erosion and wind and all these things test the structure that you're building. 
But people go through life, and they have just enough of Jesus to be dangerous. So they won't come to church, and they know this or they know that, but they don't hear God's word and apply it to their life. Hear God's word, apply it to their life. Hear God's word, apply it to their life. It's a picture as if when I hear, you know, if you hear this is how God wants your heart in the workplace, you take that and you apply it to your life Monday through Friday. If God says this is how you're to treat your wife, then you take that passage and, and you seek to apply it with the help that God brings by the power of the Holy Spirit. If the Lord says train your children like this, in the ways of the Lord, then, then you take that and you apply that. And as you do that, man, you're laying your, your home, your life, you're building a life on this solid rock and this foundation. But if you go through life and you hear all of those things, and that's what Christians do, they think that hearing the word of God or hearing the sermon is the same as doing it, and it's not. That's when Jesus, why Jesus said, you know, there are those who are hearers of the word, but not doers of the word, as James tells us. Jesus said, let him who has ears to hear, hear what the Spirit is speaking to us. So it's not enough of, for us to hear God's word. We have to hear it. We have to assimilate it. We have to process it. And then we want to seek to live it out. And then we build our house on the rock. At our, and, and so then the storms, notice in both houses, a storm came to both homes. There's a hurricane on its way towards you. It's just the way life is. And that storm's going to come, and it's going to put a test to the house that has, you know, no foundation. There are people that they've heard a lot of the Bible, they've heard a lot of God's Word, they don't apply a thing in their life, man. And then when the storm comes, boom, their house falls to pieces, and all of a sudden people go, wow, look, their whole life just crashed and burned, and it was a great fall, and look at that disaster and that tragedy. They built that life, one decision at a time, on the sand, hearing God's Word, and not applying it. Hearing God's word and not applying it. Hearing God's word and not applying it. It's not enough to know the word. It's not enough to hear the word. The word, God wants, just as Jesus was the ultimate example, that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. God wants his word to take on human flesh that we're living letters known and read by all men and to take on a real characteristic in our lives. The thing that was lacking in chapter 17 and 18 of the book of Judges was a submission to the simple, straightforward truth of the Word of God for the family, for the ministry, and for a nation. And when we look at our lives, if our life comes down, crashing around our ears when we go through the storms of life, you can bank on it. It was simply because we did not build one decision at a time. We heard God's word. We applied God's word. We heard God's word. We applied God's word. And now, no doubt, all of us fail in that in some way or shape or form. But even when we're failing, we're facing it with the Lord and saying, Lord, I'm really failing in this. Help me. I need strength. I can't do this. I need the power of the Holy Spirit. I can't live the Christian life apart from the power of the Holy Spirit. There's no way. So it, it produces a daily dependence. Like, I, I can't love my enemy the way God wants me to. I can't love my wife the way the Lord wants me to because of my human nature unless I'm in, imparted with, endued with power from on high by the Holy Spirit to be, be who God wants me to be. And so the children of Israel, no doubt Micah knew God's word. His mom, no doubt, knew God's word. The Levite, he knew God's word. The Danites knew God's word. None of them did God's word. So they're confused in the family. They're confused in their ministry. And they're confused in their nation. We live in a nation that cries out, we're a Christian nation. It's not true. We're fast becoming a pagan nation. But we have enough of God talk and lip service to still kind of pacify and sound like we, hey, God bless. God bless America. As long as you say that, everything's good, right? Be sleeping with your girlfriend, doing drugs and getting drunk and stealing and embezzling and, you know, covetous and all the other things, worshiping false things. But, hey, God bless America. God bless America. We're good. We're good. And we're on our way to face the Lord. We're on our way to face the Lord. And Jesus said, hey, man, don't be blown away. Not everybody that says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter into heaven. Not everybody. But those who have a heart that Jesus is the Lord of their life and through the power of the Holy Spirit, they want to do God's will. Those who do God, the Father's will, they're going to go to heaven. I pray that there's no confusion for us tonight. 
that the clarity of who God is and what his word says is just really getting into focus for us, for our families and our ministries, and even our, our local demographic, if you will, not the whole nation, but our own little locale of Idaho Falls, that we're shining for the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we just ask that your Holy Spirit would do a work through the truth of your word and um, in our hearts. Lord, we just ask that you'd forgive us. Lord, forgive us for getting off track. Forgive us for the confusion and disobedience. Lord, I just pray for those who are here tonight and their hearts are really heavy because there's some of those things that are so close to home that uh, it's really raw and tender right now and I just pray that your grace and your spirit and the love of God and the mercy of God would minister to that need and bring strength and bring clarity and wisdom for them in their situ situation. Help them, Lord. Help them bring glory to you. Help us all, Lord, bring glory to you. Lord, thank you for your love. Thank you for the truth of your word that inspires us, Lord, to want to be close to you. In Jesus' name, amen.